Like a PM service. Welcome to our online community. While these guys are all chatting together, say hi to your hosts, Vanya and Janet. And we are going to have an awesome time together tonight. My name is Jess. I'm one of the pastors here. So won't you stand? Oh, wait, I'm doing this whole thing at the wrong time, eh? Okay, so before we do that, because it's January and there's so much stuff happening at Grace, we're doing announcements twice, but with different announcements. So this is part one of next, telling you what is going on around Grace, check it out, and then we'll do the other stuff. Is that cool? Okay, take it away. Grace Kids are starting the year with an exciting new series today, and here is Mareka to let you know more. Hi moms and dads, here at Grace Kids, we are looking forward to seeing how God is going to use our teaching series to impact your children's lives in 2018. And we cannot wait to partner with you on your child's faith journey. We kick off 2018 with a new four-week series entitled Disciple Me. Through this series, we hope to help your children discover what it means to follow Jesus more faithfully. We'll also have a Faith at Home card for you to pick up at the Grace Kids Registration Desk so you can be part of the journey too.
Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Grace. We're going to sing and worship God, so won't you stand and join us?
so much for singing with us. Won't you take your seats? Thanks, guys. So welcome to Mshlanka PM again. For those of you who have just joined us, um, this is our evening service on a Sunday. But the thing that's beautiful about church is that it's not just about Sundays. There are ways that we connect with each other, that we worship in all through the week. And one of those ways is our youth. They started this Friday night, their 2018 year. So I'm going to ask Sia to come up. Sia Shange is our youth pastor. Yes. Hello. <laughs> and Sia and I go way back early days. I used to be his youth pastor. Um, now you're the youth pastor. What happened on Friday night? How'd it so go? So we kicked off the year on Friday night. Um, we had our first Friday and it was amazing. Uh, really, really big shout out to our youth leaders. Some of the guys are sitting here. I can't see everyone. So if you're a youth leader, why don't you just stand for a moment because you guys deserve a round of applause. Um, so yeah, I don't know where some of the other guys are. That's weak. Where are all our people? Um, yeah, these guys are amazing. So they kind of made Friday night happen. We had first Friday, had a whole bunch of activities set out in, in the building and it was, yeah, it was great. And you guys are doing like a Love More series. It's how does, what's yeah, that about? So next, this coming Friday, we start a new series called Love More. And we're going to be speaking about loving yourself and loving God. And then loving your enemies. And what's the last one? <laughs> loving your neighbor. Yes, that's the one. Um, planned really hard. Um, yeah, so that's what's <laughs> happening. That's awesome. If you are in kind of the 13 to 18-year-old age gap or you have family that's there, um, get them to youth on Friday night. It's amazing what they're doing. Now, Sia, it's not just youth happening this year for you, no, it's you're not. like about to go on this awesome adventure. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so basically um, I've been selected as one of 10 South Africans uh, to go on this program called AFRI. Um, AFRI stands for Atlantic Fellows for Racial Equity. And um, yeah, so there's 10 of us here in South Africa and 25 Americans who are going on this 12-month uh, program. And we're going to be learning about how to yeah, make the world more inclusive. Um, yeah, and um, so we're going to be heading to New York this coming week. And um, we spend a week um, attending lectures at the uh, University of Columbia, and then we're going to go down to Selma, Alabama, and we're going to be, yeah, learning about slavery, the slave trade, um, civil rights movement, and the current context in America. And then we come back, and we got two months to kind of work on that and debrief. How do we make things happen, basically? And then the Americans are going to come out here and do like yeah. some of our yeah. So story. In April, May, we do a tour of South Africa, and we go down to. Uh, Cape Town, and we do the TRC commission, um, and then we, we go up to Joburg for, um, what's it called, the Apartheid Museum, and we look at the history of South Africa, um, our current context politically, um, economically, how can we make things happen? That's really awesome. Also a little bit overwhelming and hectic. A little bit. Um, how are you feeling? Yeah, everyone's like, oh, it's amazing, you're going on this adventure. I'm like, yeah, to learn about racism, um, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, New York, it's gonna be, yeah, it's gonna be, it's gonna be cool. Like, I'm, I'm all, I'm amped and, and all of that, I'm all in. But it is heavy stuff. Like, some of the stuff that we're reading about, I mean, I was reading a module on the history of lynching the other night. I was like, this is some nice casual reading before bed, um, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so he needs our prayers a lot. A lot. Um, and so I actually want to ask you guys who stood up, youth leaders, come pray for your guy, man. Won't you come up here on the stage? Yes, we made you stand. Now we're going to make you walk. I didn't tell them we were going to do this. Please come up, everyone who leads with Sia. Because what happens on Friday nights is important. Um, a lot of our teenagers come to this service. And these, this is the generation that's going to lead South Africa into change. Yeah. Can I come on, you guys? And Sia is one of the leaders that's taking these young people on a journey that our country needs more than ever before. Um, and so we want to pray for them and honor him. And yeah, um, Dil, do you want to pray for Sia? Okay. Um, <laughs> on the spot. Um, yeah, Jesus, we just thank you so much for Sia and everything that he's doing in this youth ministry. How um, You've called him into something that uh, not a lot of people feel that they can go into. So we thank you for everything that he's doing in these youth's lives. We pray as he embarks on this adventure that is going to be exciting, but it's going to be tough. So we pray that you will continue to be with him during this time and that you'll continue to give him strength and courage to face these things. And I pray that you'll have safe travels and when he comes back, he's going to make such an impact in the world and everything is just going to be able to point towards you. So we thank you in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Awesome. We're going to miss you, Sia, but we're so excited for you. Dylan is going to be keeping the youth going so things don't die down around there. 
And um, yeah, we're gonna, there's a lot of good stuff happening this year. I was thinking about it on my way here, and I had an awesome youth pastor. When I was about 12 or 13, there was a youth pastor, like Sia, who had a huge impact on my life spiritually. And one of the things that he taught me about, that my parents probably tried to tell me, but he was cool, so I listened to him, um, was about giving and generosity. And I remember at about the age 13, uh, there was this girl that, at my school that was kind of nerdy, and I was probably a little bit mean to her, and we, weren't, we didn't get along very well. And like Sia, she got into a program to go to the States. And my aunt had just given me $20. And I remember, I don't know how this happened, but I remember like as a young 12, 13-year-old, God kind of saying to me, give her your $20 because she's going to the States. And I was like, no, she's the worst. And it's mine. I was so bleak, but I, I had this conviction that I needed to do this thing. And I gave her the $20. And... When I look back now, what I realize is that it restored a friendship between us, and more, even more significantly was that it did something to my relationship with God. And I really believe that generosity, it unlocks love as well as being an expression of love. And sometimes you have to take that first step where you do something and you're like, no, I don't want to do this, but it shifts something in our hearts. And generosity has the power to change our relationships with each other and with God because it right sizes things. It takes up us from being the number one and it turns that upside down. And that's a big part of the Christian story. So as we get ready to take up the offering, no matter how you give, no matter how much you give, that stuff's irrelevant. It's what generosity does to us that's so beautiful and is such a gift from God to us. Um, God's love is a giving love. And we get to participate in that tonight. So as the volunteers get ready, let's pray. God, it's it's hard to uh, kind of loosen our grip on something like money. um, But you're a giving God. And so we never walk away empty-handed when we open ourselves up to you. And so I pray that as we give tonight, um, so much more than money is is being exchanged here, Lord, that your love is kind of softening our hearts, opening us up to to you and to your ways, and and we get to participate with you in healing this world, in loving other people. So thank you for, for pursuing us with your love and including us in what your love can accomplish in this world. We're grateful for that tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. While the baskets go around, we've got some more announcements for you because it's January and it's all the things, and check out the screen. Hi everyone, I'm Garth and welcome to Grace Family Church. There's a lot coming up at Grace, so let's take a look at where you can get involved. The Alpha Film Series starts next week. If you're exploring faith or have never tried Alpha, you don't want to miss this course. We believe that everyone should have the chance to explore the Christian faith, ask questions and share their point of view. Each Alpha session includes good food and free coffee, a compelling video talk and great conversation. Sign up today on the Grace app, our website, or at the info desk. There's no pressure and no charge. Invite a friend and come as you are. See you next week. On Sunday the 4th of February, we'll be having water baptisms in our services. At Grace, we believe water baptism is a step of faith that declares our new life in Christ. You don't have to sign up. Just arrive on Sunday with a change of clothes and a towel. We have more info about baptism on our website at grace.za.org. If you have a child in grade 7, then this year they are invited to join youth. Youth happens at Grace and Schlanger every Friday night during school term and on a Sunday they sit together in the 5.30 am Schlanger PM service. Youth is a space for teens aged 13 to 18 where they can connect with friends and explore faith together. For more info, you can contact Sia at Grace. On that note, our youth kick off a new series this coming Friday called Love More. 
Over the next three weeks, we will be looking at loving God and ourselves, loving our neighbors, and loving our enemies in our new series called Love More. You do not want to miss this one. So if you're 13 to 18, come along this Friday night. We'll see you there. The business development course that we run at Grace is coming up in March. This nine-week course offers practical business skills to micro-entrepreneurs. The course is run by volunteers who walk a journey of development with the attendees. Take a look at what it's all about. Here at Grace Family Church, we believe we can make a difference by joining God's mission to heal the world. One of our missions and justice projects is a business development program called Paradigm Shift. Run by volunteers at Grace, we have seen hundreds of men and women realize their potential as entrepreneurs, while at the same time finding their identity in Jesus' hope and plan for their lives. This project is about empowering materially poor and relationally broken individuals, upskilling them to make a difference in their micro businesses and hence their families and communities. The nine week course provides not only business skills, but is a holistic journey that helps entrepreneurs become self sustainable. I had a great experience. Uh, the team that I was uh, given the opportunity to train, they were awesome as well. Uh, I just had a great time because I was learning myself, so yeah, I had a great time. Volunteer trainers are given the tools to facilitate programs and engage in the lives of these entrepreneurs, making a huge impact in their journeys. You don't need to have a background in business training to become a trainer, just a heart to serve and a willingness to bring change to someone's life. I've got my, we have our business, our small business with my husband, me and my husband, but we're doing it small, small, small. I believe that there will be shift in our business because of this wonderful time. I just want to thank you guys, you are awesome. This is a significant space for us to volunteer in. And it is here that we not only grow in ourselves, but we get the opportunity to bring hope and new life to macro entrepreneurs. If this is a volunteer space you'd like to be involved in, then sign up after the service to join us for facilitators training on Monday the 5th or the 12th of February. If you'd like more details before then, then email me, Garth at Grace. Our first day mission of the year is to William Clark Gardens, where we'll be painting window frames and hanging curtains. Day missions are open to all and are a great way to get involved in helping communities in need. Sign up online to join the team or email Jill at Grace. For a reminder about this info, take a look at our brochure. Otherwise, visit our website or app where we have a calendar of events and info about groups you can be a part of. We'd love to connect with you on your favorite social media platform too. But for now, enjoy the rest of the service. Awesome. Well, good evening from me. My name is Paul, and it is really so good to be together this evening. Uh, really excited for the next little while. But uh, I've just introduced myself to you. I'd love you to just spend a minute uh, turning to the person next to you and not introducing yourself to them, but telling them, because you probably know them, but telling them when you meet someone new, how do you introduce yourself to them? So last week, Jess spoke about how when she was on a plane, um, she sat there and, and she turned to the per person next to her and she said, I'm a pastor. And like, shut down conversation immediately. Um, you, what's your first line? When you meet someone new, aside from my name is, because if you don't do that, some social skills we need to develop together. Um, but once you've got past the name thing, what is the first sentence that you say when you're introducing yourself? To those of you who are joining us online, what I'd love you to do is to write that sentence to Vanya and ja uh, Janet, our two online hosts. They'll write their sentences. So introduce yourselves to one another online. Uh, we love that community and it is so good to have them with us. So you've got a minute. Turn to the person next to you. How do you introduce yourself?
That's awesome. Hey, won't you turn to the person on your other side and say, how's it second choice? <laughs> if that person is your spouse, don't say that sentence. Honestly, for real, it will get you into a lot of trouble. So I'm, uh, I'm excited for tonight. We're in this series called Love and Light, and we're reading through the book of 1 John. Uh, and I really want to encourage you uh, to spend some time, if you haven't already, spend some, ch- uh, some time reading this incredible book. Uh, it's filled with this reality of God being a God of love and a God of light and how that impacts us. And I don't know about you, but as I look into my own life, as I look into my own world, uh, I need a bit of God's love and a bit of God's light. And I don't know about you, but as I look at the world around me, I think that our world needs a little bit of God's love and God's light. And last week and the week before, Jess sort of led us through this idea of what God's light means and how God's light in our life leads us to be light in other people's lives, how we're called to belong and yet how we're called to love others. We're, we're called to be this light, but tonight I want to focus just on what, is, what does God's love mean? What does God's love look like? And the reason why I want to spend some time in there is because as we begin to read 1 John chapter 3, these are the first few words of the first uh, verse in 1 John chapter 3. It says this, see how very much our Father loves us. See how very much our Father loves us. And what I want to look at tonight is I want to look at what does that, what does that mean what does it like actually mean? What does it look like? And maybe the more important question is, does it really matter? Does it matter to see what God's love really looks like and to really understand it? And, and maybe for you, you're, you've been on this journey for a while. Does it matter that God loves you? Maybe you've been uh, on this journey for a while and, and, and you're sort of wondering whether, where that love has gone. And so you're, you're thinking about whether it matters. Maybe uh, tonight you're just starting to battle to engage with the idea of there actually being a God. And so you're sort of wondering, does God's love exist? And so I want to spend some time to do that. Now, I want to just pause here for, for a moment and say we don't need that just yet. The keys are good, though. Um, <laughs> The first thing that I think you'd probably notice is is this word father. And for some of you, that may be problematic in and of itself. So so as we read this first passage, it says, see how very much our father loves us. For some of you, that word may be the the stumbling block. That may be the thing that you're saying, I'm disengaging already. Maybe it's because of, of something that's happened in your life. Maybe it's because of what that image, that word brings up in your world. Maybe it's because of your story. But what I really want to encourage you to do tonight is to engage with the loving image of a God, not the the warped perception of a patriarchal figure in society. I want to encourage you to engage with what does it mean for God to love you? And let me, let me tell you why this means something to me is, is I, my, I lost my dad when I, when I was young. When I, when I was 10 years old, uh, my father was killed. And so when I started to engage with this whole faith thing and started to hear about this God who was a God of love, this father love for me, I, I actually couldn't comprehend that. I couldn't understand what that actually meant, a father who loved me. Not because he didn't love me, but because I didn't have any example of what that actually looked like. And so maybe you'll find yourself in different spaces, but what I want to do is is I want to engage with what does God's love look like? Because I think God's love is important, well, it's important for us to know, and it's important for us to experience what God's love is. I think it's important for us to know and to experience what God's love is. And so in order to do that, I want to expand on some of that idea, and then I want us to experience it together. I think the first thing we need to know about God's love is that God's love is eternal. God's love is eternal. It was in the beginning. It will always be. It is now. God's love is never ending and it has never had a beginning. And that is a foreign concept maybe to you. But I just want to encourage you to know God's unfailing love endures forever. God's unfailing love endures forever forever. His love is eternal. And and we're not worshiping, as Jess spoke about last week, we're not worshiping the idea of love or the concept of love. We're worshiping a God who is intrinsically love, whose central characteristic is love. God's love is eternal. It is always. And not only is God's love eternal, but God's love is for all. 
God's love is for all. It is for, as you read the, the story of Scripture, you see that God's love is for all. For every person, every creed, every background, every preference, every belief, God's love is for all of mankind. And not only is God's love for all of mankind, the redemptive narrative, the story of Scripture, says that God's love is for all of creation. His love is vast, it's all-encompassing, and it is everywhere. This eternal love of God is a love for all. And yet so beautifully, this eternal love of God that is for all is for you. That God's love is for us. It's for you. It's not a distant notion or foreign concept. It's a personal experience. God loves you. Not just an, an idea, but God loves you. This vast love, this love that encompasses everything, is a love that loves you. And, and I want to sit here for a moment because I think sometimes we can come to an environment like this and just hear things like that and they can just sort of pass over us. But this eternal love of God that is for all is also for us. You sitting here right now. What does that mean to you? Where does that find you? And I think the, the interesting thing here, for me at least, is that God's love for me is not based on my ability to be lovable. Because I'm not. If you ask my wife for any number of seconds, am I lovable? No. It's difficult. It's a tough relationship, right? And, and I think we know this. Like some of us know this. Our ability to love other people, if it's just based on their ability to be good enough, it's difficult. Because we fall short sometimes. God's love for you is based on the fact that he is a God of love, and therefore out of him being love, he loves you. So his love for you is not based on your ability to be good enough, but on his ability to always love. And because of this ability to always love, his love, his love can never, ever be separated from you. His love is always present, and it is unconditional. God's love for you is unconditional. God's love for us is unconditional. If you read through the book of Romans, we know this, that there is no height, no depth, no, no power, no principality, no ruler, no authority. There is no challenge you'll face tomorrow or circumstance you've been through that will, that will separate you from God's love. His love is unconditional. And because his love is unconditional, it, it leads him to a place where his love is self-sacrificing. The love of God is self-sacrificing. What do I mean by that? If we read uh, 1 John 3, 16, it says this. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. I want to read that to you again. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. If you're exploring this idea of what does love look like, you need to turn to, to Jesus on the cross to a God whose eternal love for all and for you, this eternal love that could never be separated from you, would lead him to a place where he could, he could take away all the things that once separated you and make a way for you to encounter his love. His love is self-sacrificing. And because of his self-sacrificing love, we can know this. His love is here. God's love is here in this moment right now. God's love is not, like I said earlier, God's love is not just a foreign concept, but it's something that, yes, we can know but it is also something that we can experience. As we read through, again, through the book of Romans, there's this beautiful line, and the Spirit allows us to cry out, Abba, Father. It's a term of endearment. It's, it's like crying out, Daddy. Whatever your affectionate term would be for that person in your life, mother, father, dad, mommy, whatever it is, there is an affectionate term of love that God allows us to call out. And He wants us to experience it. Now, we're going to experience God's love through a number of different environments and, and through a number of different ways, and I'm going to unpack that a little bit later. But we wanted to create a moment now where we could experience God's love together. And we're going to do that through song, and I, I, I'm not the best singer, and I'm certainly no musician, but music has this ability to allow us to sing and express what's really going on inside. And it also has this ability to allow us to say and sing things that we can then step into. We can proclaim a truth that we can then hold on to. 
Now, I know for some of you, this, this concept of God being love is still a foreign thing for you. And so maybe you're just exploring. Maybe the idea of standing up now in the middle of a service and singing a little bit more is too much. I invite you to just sit and listen and let the words flow over you. But maybe for some of us, we, we need to stand in this moment and declare the truth that we need to hold on to. That there is an eternal love of God. It, it, it will never end for you and it will never end for us. It's self-sacrificing and it is here. It's here. So can I invite you to stand for a moment? If you're joining us online, I wanna encourage you just in this time, if you just wanna sit, uh, you're welcome to engage in conversation, but maybe you just wanna sit and, and participate and listen to these words. But, but I invite us to, to stand in this moment and declare and experience God's love. So God, we just thank you that you are here. And we just pray that as we sing these things now, that we would know and experience your love. God, it may not be uh, in crazy ways, but just in stillness and silence. Help us to know and experience your love, God. Searching for us. 
presence in a grace so relentless I am one by perfect love wrapped within the arms of heaven in a peace that lasts forever sinking So oh. 
deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. Thank you that it is here, this vast love for us, for me, for, for us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your seats. Ben, thank you so much uh, for standing so long on the stage and for leading us so well. I, I want to acknowledge again uh, what I said just before we ran into this, uh, into the space that uh, for some of you, you may have been sitting in that uh, going, that was way too much singing. I understand that, and we'll get to that in a little bit. For others of you, uh, this idea of singing to God is still uh, a long way down on your journey. Um, but I, I want you to walk away, if that was you, with this idea. If you walk away with nothing else, um, we don't usually like do this whole middle chunk of the service singing thing. You're welcome to come back next week if this was all too much. But I'd love you to walk away with this idea. 
that God loves you. That there is a God who has this eternal, vast, all-encompassing, powerful love. And if you walk away from this time with nothing else, walk away with that he loves you. That there is this God who loves you, because that's just so important. But I want to ask the question again, that question that I asked earlier, why does it matter? Why does it matter that God loves us? And as, as I read through this book, this, this book of 1 John, and particular as I, particularly as I engage with chapter 3, I think that there's two reasons why it matters that God loves us. And I want to illustrate the first one to you by speaking about running. Now, just to let you know how much of an expert I am in running, um, just by standing on stage, I've done my most steps this week, right? Um, and, and actually, the little like, smart thingy that does tri- like fitness things, it, it, during singing, it said, keep up the good activity, Okay, so I'm an expert in running, right? Um, I'm an expert in running. You, if you see me on the promenade, I apologize now in advance. Um, but I think that there's three kinds of runnings that we can engage. I think there's probably more if you're an expert, but I'm going to just say there's three. I think that we can run when we're pushed. I think we can run when we're chased. And I think we can run when we're drawn to something. I think that there's three kinds of running. There's running when we're being pushed. There's running when we're being chased. And then there's running when we're being drawn by something. So I remember at uh, school all those many years ago, and even after school, sort of like club sports and, and just every now and again, whenever I run with someone, I'm actually running against someone. I don't know if you know this, but like that, maybe that's just me, and I'm happy that it's just me. But if ever I'm running with someone, I'm a hundred, even if it's my wife, like we're running, I'm always that step ahead. There's always a race, and, and at school, sometimes it was because of like rules, and, and, and you had to do cross country, and then at like club sport, it was because you had to be fit, and all that kind of stuff, you know, and, and so we, we can find ourselves in, in these spaces where we're being pushed to run, and uh, maybe that's enjoyable for you, not for me. Um, we can be pushed, and then I think we can be chased. I'm not talking about like the sum of chasing when you're running, like, hey, I shouldn't be doing this thing, and now I'm running. Uh, you know, my daughter, a little one, um, we have two TV remotes, one that works the TV and one that is identical, no batteries, and she can chew on that one. Like she can just, she can eat that thing, but there's two remotes. But here's the thing, they'll both like, one will be on the, t- on the table and the other one will be like up on the other thing there. And she'll know that that's the real one. She, she knows that this is the fake one. And so she like casually like just cruises over. She gets like the, the real remote. She looks at you because now she knows you, she's got the remote that she shouldn't have. She grabs it off the table and then she does this like arms back, just like running thing. And the tripping is actually literal as well. So she's being chased. She knows she's doing something she shouldn't do, and now she's being chased. And there's other spaces in our lives where you've done that thing you know you shouldn't be doing. This was mainly mainly me at school. And then you run because you you shouldn't have done that thing. Not too much, Mark, I promise. It was only every now and again. And never here while while I've been working at Grace. But we get this this running uh, where we're being pushed. We get get running when we're being chased. And I think that there's another space where we actually enjoy it, where we're being drawn towards something. There's there's an expression of happiness when we do it. And if that's you, come and chat to me afterwards. I want to learn your secrets. But there's these kind of these these spaces of running and I think when it comes to our faith we can have the same experience and I want to illustrate that to you and because we're in a series called love and light I'm going to illustrate it with this light some of you will get that lame joke later okay this is our faith I think we we take this idea of running and and running away running uh, while we're being pushed and being drawn into our faith See, I think for some of us, when it comes to our faith, for some of us, we're being chased. For some of us, we're being pushed. And then maybe there's the opportunity to be drawn in. Let me explain. I think for some, and at least I think there's seasons in our lives where we go through this, and maybe you don't find yourself in exactly this, but maybe it's more gentle. But there's seasons in our lives where we're being chased by our fears, by our hopelessness, by our past, by our actions, by our worries, our insecurities. Those things are there, and so we're being chased. We're being chased towards God. And I'm not saying being chased towards God's not a good thing, but sometimes we're being chased. I think other times we're being pushed towards God. We're being pushed by families. We're being being pushed by religion, by duty, by being good enough, by acting a particular way. Maybe you're sitting here tonight because you're being pushed. Don't nudge your parent if that's you, right? Just don't do that thing. But sometimes we we move towards God because we're being pushed by something. 
And here's the challenge, right? Whatever is chasing us often overcomes us. And whatever is pushing us often tires us out. The past catches up and it shows up in our future. Our hopelessness does reside sometimes in our hearts again. The things that chase us can have the ability to, to overpower us. The things that push us, if I'm honest, when I'm running against someone, it's mainly my ego that's, keep, that's keeping me going. And eventually it's go, it goes, I'm, I'm not that strong and I've got to slow down. So often the things that push us, they're empty. They don't motivate us. They don't move us towards God. And I think what this passage is saying and, and why it's so important that we know that God loves us is because God's love needs to be the light that draws us in. It's so important for us to see how very much God loves us because his love for us needs to be the motivating factor to our faith. We need to be running towards the love of God in our lives, not running away from something or being pushed by something. Because when we run towards the love of God in our lives, it's the ability to, no matter where we are in our walk, no matter what's going on in our world, God's love is always present and it is always there and it is always something we can move towards. And the beautiful reality is this. Not only do we get to run towards God's love, but it moves towards us. God's love moves towards us and, and that's why Jesus came. Jesus came so that the things that were chasing me in my past my fears and my insecurities and my failings could go onto his shoulders. Jesus came so that the things that were pushing me, the, the, the need to be good enough and religious duty, he fulfilled them all so that I could just simply stand and look at the love of God and allow it to draw me in and to be drawn towards it as it draws towards me. God's love, God's love needs to be the motivating factor to our faith, the thing that we run towards. So how do we do that? What does that actually mean and what does that look like? How do you and I run towards God's love? And I think we need to pursue it. We need to pursue God's love to actively seek out ways to experience and know God's love. And I do think it's those two things, to experience and know God's love. Now again, some of you were sitting here and that whole singing thing was just way too much. Mark, I know you're a big fan of the singing. And if I'm honest, singing is not always the place where I get to experience that, but maybe for you, it's in stillness and in quiet. Maybe the way that you need to know and discover and experience God's love is by reading the, 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 the stories in Scripture about His affection for you and for all. Spending time quietly thinking about that, pondering, journaling, writing, praying. Maybe for you, it's just sitting in stillness and saying, God, why don't you teach me, show me what love is. For some of us, we, we find that in community. We find that here on a Sunday or maybe in a small group or, or maybe when we're serving with people alongside us. We get to experience God's love because of the community that we belong to. And I just want to quickly say this. This is a little like sort of side note here. If you are new or visiting, I want to invite you to connect into this community. Because this is a phenomenal place to experience God's love. And if that is you, after the service, Jess is going to be doing Engage One. It's at the back, inside the auditorium, on those couches. Why don't you just stay? Because a beautiful way that we get to experience God's love is by being in a community of people who are discovering God's love together. And we don't always get this right. But man, when we go on that journey together, we get to experience it because it's His love towards us. I love Jesus' story of, of how generosity, giving is a way to receive. God's love is the same. When we give God's love, we get to experience God's love. When we demonstrate God's love, we get to receive God's love as well. Can I encourage you? What is the thing that you need to be doing? Is it stillness? Is it quiet? Is it reading? Is it knowing? Is it drawing? Is it looking at the sunrise how are you going to experience God's love? Because it needs to be the motiv motivating factor to our faith. I think the second thing, as I read through this passage, uh, the first thing I notice is, is that we need to allow God's love to be the motivating factor in our lives. We need to pursue, actively pursue God's love. But the second thing is, as this passage continues, I want to read to you from 1 John 3, uh, still in verse 1. 
And it says this, see how very much our Father loves us. For he calls us his children. And that is who we are. See how very much our Father loves us. See how very much God loves us. That he calls us his children. And that is who we are. Earlier I asked you to, I asked you to describe yourself uh, to someone next to you. And I think so often what we do as human beings is we start off with what we do. I, I do this job, I work in this way. I think maybe some of you are like really loopy, you describe yourself as fun and energetic. And then the person that you're talking to runs away. But usually we just go with the standard do, right? The standard things that we do in society. And, and that's good. But I think so often we translate that into our faith. We call someone or ourselves a Christian because of what we do. We look at someone and say they're not a Christian because they do. We think of ourselves to say, I need to be a Christian, so I must do. And what this passage is saying to us is that our Christian identity is not based on our action, but our adoption. Your identity as someone whom God loves is not based on your action, but on your adoption. Because God loves you so much, he has called you a child, a son, a daughter. And that is who you are. That we need to live out of that space. Live from that place. Live out of that reality. I want to give us a moment to think about this and, and reflect and respond. God's love is something that we can know. God's love is something that we can experience. God's love is something that should, that should be and isn't always. It's not always for me. There's times where there's duty, there's times where it's tiring, there's times where faith isn't that exciting, but, but man, if I can just have that light to run towards, it will never run dry, it will never end, and Jesus has made a way for me to experience it. We need to know God's love, because it changes how we see ourselves. Can I ask you to close your eyes? Um, if you don't want to, you really don't need to. But I think that there's potentially a number of different spaces this message could land for you. There's some of us who are sitting here, and this is a new concept. The idea of God loving you is a new thing to you. And maybe tonight you're saying, you know what, I, I want to find my identity. I want to begin this journey of being a child of God because he loves me. And so maybe tonight you would use a prayer that we're going to use in just a little moment just to say, God, help me to know your love and to experience your love and to walk in your love. But maybe for some of you sitting here tonight, this notion, at least this is, if I'm honest with you, being my prayer, is that there's times where it runs dry, where it just seems a little too much. It just seems a little too un unattainable. It just, it's not the thing that's motivating me. And maybe tonight we just need to use a prayer, a moment to say, God, help me again to be motivated by your love. And then I think that there's others who similarly have been on this journey for a while and maybe your faith has never been about that. Maybe your, your walking with God has never been about God's love for you and how that changes you. And tonight you're going to say, God, I want to change that story in my life. So this is going to be the prayer. It's, I'm going to read it to you. And if you would like to respond, we're going to pray it together. And you can just pray it quietly in your mind. But this is the prayer, and maybe you would pray it too. God, thank you that you are love. And that Jesus made a way for me to experience and express that love. Help me to know this love more and help me to show this love more. If that is you, I want to invite you now in this moment to pray with me. It's going to be on the screens if you'd like to use these words. Let's pray together. God, thank you that you love me. Thank you that you are love. And that Jesus made a way for me to experience and to express that love. Help me to know this more and help me to show this more. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Paul. We're going to close now. Won't you stand? And what Paul has said to us tonight is really that we can experience God's love. We can express God's love. Uh, we can know it and we can show it. And so as you go today, as you walk up those stairs and you walk out, ask yourself this question. How am I going to show God's love this week? Not because of what I do, but because of who I am. You are loved, so let's go and be a group of people who love others. If you're new, I'm going to be at Engage One afterwards. I'd love to meet you, but otherwise have an awesome week and go in love. We'll see you next week.